hopefully teaching uh, about, last week we talked about becoming an apostolic. And just a little bit of review, most of it, I, I started with what is an apostolic. Um, apostolic, you can look it up, you could Google it, it will tell you that they believe in the Holy Spirit. And I think we probably don't overemphasize that. I think the baptism of the Holy Ghost is really what makes it all work. You, that's your point to say amen. They are recording, so it's nice to have the crowd. Right. <laughs> and uh, apost becoming apostolic in and of itself is, uh, I say, life-changing experience. And that really is, does it do it justice? It is powerful. It uh, transforms lives. Um, I have a Bible study that I'm teaching. Um, the young man it is a young, young father. He's got two sons. And um, right now it's like the topic of my discussion because um, I was amazed after one lesson, uh, this young man who had you know, it doesn't take long to get your life in chaos. It, does, it doesn't take long for uh, the values to become distorted. And, of course, the enemy then takes advantage of that and the things that can happen. Uh, I, you know, the ones that are mo the most obvious today, I think, are um, drugs and alcohol, uh, but actually it's much more than that. There's so many things inside of a person um, that, um, you know, just happen. Sin never takes a person only where they want to go. It always takes them further than they planned on. And so new birth is literally, it's, if, if we can gain this understanding, it will help us even, that uh, you, you must be born again, Jesus said, because the truth is, physically, when you're born into this world, spiritually, you are born dead. You do not have life. I mean, you, you, you have existence, but... To be born again is to be born into, to have your spiritual life awakened. It becomes, um, I don't even know if I have the right words to describe it, but I'm just telling you, it's a new you. It's a new person. And Jesus said you must be born again. I, or earlier, Brother Gregory walked up here. I was talking with Brother Dan and Gregory walked up, and I, I always marvel. I can't imagine today... Brother Gregory being homeless, being a cocaine addict, and sleeping under a bridge, homeless. I can't imagine that. Because I look at this guy who's wearing a three-piece suit, Mr. And, and I say, and he said to me, this is what he does. This is what God does. And I thought, that's really the truth. That's what it means to be apostolic. We're not just, and today you almost have to clarify some of these things. We're not just, somebody said, well, I'm Pentecostal in experience. So I want you to know it's more than an experience. Yes, it is an experience, but it's more than that. It's life itself. And then, uh, of course, baptism in the name of Jesus. Oh, how many people have, how many of us have thought, man, if I could just start over again. Hello? That's what baptism in Jesus' name does for us. It washes our past away and gives us a whole new life. And so at, to, be, to become apostolic is like 
it is not like it is a, a, a complete change in direction. We were headed one way, but God has come and set us on another path going a complete different direction. And so there's so much that we need to learn. And sometimes we learn, and, and there's multiple ways. We learn through good Bible teaching, and we are blessed here. We have good Bible teachers, and we have people who desire. That's why home Bible studies are so effective. And that's another time you say amen. Try, try to warm up a little bit and clap your hands. Um, there's just advantages and this is not just pastor staten's opinion it's biblically the truth there is there is power and authority in the word of god and it changes lives now i i I remember when i started this one study actually two studies about that same time but i remember when i started them i was in prayer and god spoke to me and said have faith in my word. Have confidence in the word. It's not about you. Your personality doesn't save anybody. People have to become more, for example, more than preachers saved. I love you. You love me. But we're not the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And, and so last week, kind of as an introduction, I talked about a little bit about becoming apostolic and then we started on the journey my wife gave her a, a good por portion of her testimony of becoming an apostolic see religion religion is even the bible talks about pure religion so religion is not a bad word religion is kind of like doing things for other people that's not a bad thing but it's not salvation, and it won't satisfy the soul. All the good works that you and I might accomplish do not meet the spiritual need that's inside. And so we teach and we tell testimonies, uh, that, which is there's just something incredible about, um, even though you may not think so, about your testimony. I, you know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many times I've gone to preach a conference and I've told Evelyn's testimony of at the age of five, she prayed for her family and God came to her family's rescue. And that's such, you understand, that's like, and I minimized it, you know, there's all the details that, that go into that. The time spent, God listening to the prayer of a five-year-old little girl and making a difference in her family. I mean, you know, we need to hear that stuff repeated to us because sometimes we lack confidence. It's not that we still believe in prayer, but we lack confidence that God would really hear our prayer. And, and so part of our journey today is going to go from from becoming an apostolic, which is, uh, when I say an apostolic family, all right, and becoming that. We become that. See, you can be positionally an apostolic. That's through repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus, receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues. You can become positionally an apostolic and yet not practice the apostolic way of life and in order for us to make a difference in our world and i'm thankful you're apostolic positionally but i'm telling you it's got to become more than that it must become a lifestyle the way we live we think different hello we don't think like the world and if if you if the enemy can get you, if he can bring your thinking down to where you begin to think on the level of the world, he has shortchanged you. He's robbing you of what God has in store for you. We don't think the same as the world. 
And apostolic thinking is not just like a, it, it, it develops. And that's the key word for today. It develops. We are still developing as an apostolic church. We are still developing as an apostolic family. We are still developing as an apostolic person. And, and so with that said, I'm going to start on the, our development. Um, and we're not, in a sense, we're not lecturing, okay? We are going to use our life's experiences to teach, and there are many. I, how many of you have met Marisha? Sister Marisha, you know, she works there and she was in first touch system. All right, right. But I asked her today about her background and her parents became first generation apostolics. In other words, they were the first ones in her family to experience baptism in the name of Jesus and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. All right. And, um, and so that makes her Second generation. She grew up apostolic. That, you know, don't misunderstand me. That does not mean you grow up problem free. It doesn't mean you grow up with no struggles or that you can live off of the faith of your parents. As a matter of fact, in some ways, being a second generation can be uh, in some ways dangerous because you have to come to a place there. Somebody who said it this way, that Jesus has no grandchildren. You must have your personal experience with Jesus. That's one thing about being an, ap- being an apostolic. We're just saying we are following after what the apostles taught, and they taught what Jesus taught. And so uh, I'm going to start with uh, now. My, we, we stopped last week where we had arrived uh, Right, we we just got married, and she was so good looking. She is good looking, <laughs> and uh, sorry, honey. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing you got to learn to do is ask forgiveness. <laughs> Don't be too stubborn. Hello, that's an apostolic teaching right there. Right. When we arrived in uh, Stockton, um, well, let, let's go back. Our experience, the transition for me coming home is where I'm going to start with. And then, then Linda, we've kind of charted it out today, how we're going to talk about our development and how that development, how we watched it be passed on to our children now, I'm, I'm going to tell you something very sad, I, and this is a little bit negative, and I don't mean it to be, but I've known some apostolic families that did not develop. I'm going to say that again. You see, it's the will of God for our apostolic families to develop. It's the desire of God, just like the people that I go reach and teach Bible studies to. It's the desire of God for my children and my children's children to be saved, to experience new birth and have a personal, living, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the will of God. But it doesn't automatically happen because I come to church. It doesn't automatically happen because I am an apostolic Pentecostal believer. It doesn't happen automatically. You need to understand that. That it doesn't mean that just because my mom was, I am. It doesn't work that way. You must have your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my experience had taken place. There's terms they use for it. Epiphany. It's a, a moment in time. My, you know, we have those things happen sometimes. And especially when you look back on your life, uh, it, it, the difference when Jesus comes in and you, you watch, he'll bring you to people. He'll put things in your life. He'll cause supernatural moments to happen because that's what he does. I, I started off a while ago by saying God is on the move. 
And we sing a song around here once in a while, Waymaker. And it said, even when I don't, he's working, right? Even when I don't see him, he's working. He's working. He's working. Listen, that's an element of faith. You must believe that. That's not just nice words in a song. It's a truth of God's word that God is working. While we're sitting here today, God is not idle, just observing us. He is involved in the work of people's lives all around this city. There was, somebody could help me, but there was, I think, one of the prophets here who he had come to a place, he was discouraged, and he thought he was the only one left. And God said, well, I got, what was it, 5,000, 4,000 others out there. He didn't see them. I don't see where they're at. But that I just, you must have confidence that God is working. Like today, <laughs> incredible last Sunday, Jim's father came and was prayed for. And I got, just like many of you, I got the testimony, right? It's a miracle happened. He was healed. That's what apostolics do. We believe in a God who is alive and well and vibrant and moving. We may have our limitations. We certainly do have our limitations, but there is no limit that you can put on what God can do. So it was literally in six months time in my life, I went from, and you know, sometimes I don't even want to anymore tell how bad my life was. Just, I don't want the devil to get any credit. All I can tell you, he was taking me down a very dark pathway and destruction was going to be the end. And I'll say it, that's when Jesus stepped in. That's when Jesus stepped in and he, that through new birth, he changed the entire direction I was going. There were key elements involved and there are key elements involved in being an apostolic. We, we, we don't just read books about prayer. We don't just dream about prayer. We don't just talk about prayer. We pray. Apostolics pray. We don't just I mean, the same with the word. We have, and, and that must grow with this. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Prayer and the word and supernatural, spiritual experiences. And in six months time, um, you know, I, I tell the story now, immediately on that first day, God delivered me. See, he didn't just deliver me from the, the habit. He delivered me from the desire for the habit. From, yes, he changed me inside. I no longer wanted the drugs. I no longer wanted the alcohol. I no longer wanted those things in my life. He changed me inside, and the change on the inside affected me on the outside. That's what it means to be apostolic. And, and listen, folks, we cannot afford in our world today, we cannot afford to accept less. It, another kind of whatever pseudo religion or you understand what i'm saying it won't help the world but if we can say to our world the god that i know who changed my life is still in business today and still changing lives today and you may be looking at a situation today in your family that looks impossible looks impossible but with god all things are possible you know, today, today in a little bit, Catherine's father is coming today. And he's had some things happen. Health issues have happened, but he is coming. And he told me sitting uh, in his uh, living room the other day, he said, uh, it, tears streaming down his face. He said, oh, if Jesus will heal me, 
Now, listen, all I know is this. There is a merciful God, and God doesn't just give us what we deserve. If he gave us what we deserve, we'd all be bankrupt. He is a God of grace and mercy. He is kind, benevolent, seeking, seeking, seeking people who have a a, a desire, a thirst, a hungry, a hunger for him. So it was in that first six months, the, the greatest struggle in my life was with tobacco at that point. I, I, you know, it's interesting. The drugs, the alcohol, a filthy mouth, a filthy mind. Jesus Christ is so clean and pure. He delivered me from those things, no problem. And even to this day, some 46 years later, I still am amazed Sometimes I wake up in the morning and pinch myself to see if I'm still the person that God has developed me to be. Not, not, don't, don't misunderstand me. Not perfect, but boy, I'm sure a lot better off than I was 46 years ago. But the one, that tobacco thing, it, it hung on. It, and I am convinced, and this is the part that I want to make, it's a spirit it's an unclean spirit often attached to many of those things. And deliverance is essential. We apostolics believe that the power of the name of Jesus can deliver people. They will no longer be slaves. They will no longer be in bondage to the addictions of this world. Through the power of the presence and the name of The name, we are a people who believe in a name that's above every name. We call on the name of Jesus, not because it's tradition or ritual. We have found him to be a real living person. So when I arrived back home after 30 hours of on the flight from Da Nang to to Japan and then finally to landing in uh, California and uh, the world had changed while I was gone but I, I'm not my point that I wanted to get to with this I had the opportunity my very first night back in the states after getting down and kissing the ground and thanking God I was back home safe hello hey JJ how you doing bud no nope, that's Josh Josh come on back Josh well, maybe later. At the airport, and this is a significant, I'm going to tell the story, but it's, a, it's very significant. Apostolics believe in the supernatural. You hear me? Now, God's going to build your faith in it. Some things are going to happen. It's not just a matter. Yes, it's in the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. And yes, it has happened in other lives. And there are books written on the subject. I've got one written about Catholics who believe in miracles. God's hand doesn't just reach to uh, people who, uh, you know, in a sense, are favored by God. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And uh, so I'm walking down this hall in, in the airport, and, and uh, I just got home. I was so glad to be back home, and I'm walking down, and I see these three guys, and I never met these guys before in my life. And this needs to be said. The other thing is learning to hear and recognize the voice of God is so important in what we do. And that's not just like in the beginning. Even here, we need to be able to discern when God is speaking to us. And I see these three guys, and uh, that voice speaks to me and says, uh, go speak to those men. They're going to tell you what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Now, that's pretty powerful. Hello? So I walked over to these guys, I said, and I'm sure they thought I was some freak, right? <laughs> but I said, praise God, brothers! You know, new converts are wonderful people. I promise you, we need about five rows of new converts. They will shake our whole world up. They believe, they have faith, they're radical, and they have no fear. They think they can conquer every devil. Hello? 
And so I just said, praise God, brothers. And these, these guys turned around and looked at me. And finally, I said to them, I said, hey, God just spoke to me and told me, you're going to tell me what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> and one of them said to me, said, well, we are teachers at a Bible college. I'm going to give you the card. School starts the 3rd of January. Be there. It was like God telling me. So I was like, this ain't like no question. This is what we're going to do. And from that point, literally, that gave us direction for our future. And I'm telling you, folks, God will give us direction. We must allow him to refresh. We need a baptism A refreshing, a revival of believing in the supernatural. That God will get involved in the affairs even of our families. And so uh, on the 3rd of January, and we had so, like we, I, I can't even express this enough. We were just married like three days, right? Four days, five days. Yeah, real like, right, less than a week. And we got put everything we owned, which wasn't much, in a little bitty U-Haul trailer. And we drove. And think, I think back on it, I wouldn't have trusted that car. I mean, when you're young and I got Jesus, I could drive it anywhere, to the moon and back. And we were so in love, not in love with each other and in love with Jesus and our lives. We said, whatever you want. Folks, listen, those cannot be idle words. Because God is going to take you at your word. If you will say to him, I give myself to you. We sing songs about that, but I'm not sure that we really like, you know, hello? Hello? Right? I think we need to, though. I think we need to say, okay, I'm in it. I'm in it, Lord. Whatever you want. Here I am. Whatever is left of my life, it belongs to you. Amen? And so we arrived in Stockton and our first church service, and I'm going to um, let Linda take over. I will cheer her on. Did I leave any time? A little. A little. Well, we arrived in Stockton. First of all, I want to say, if I were to ask how many of you were raised in the apostolic truth, I won't, I'm not going to do it, but if I were to have you stand, I have a feeling there wouldn't be a whole lot of us, or you, because I wasn't. But this is what God has brought you to. He's led you to his truth. And so we are blessed We are a blessed people because God brought us out of whatever we were in in an inn before and he enlightened us with his truth. And we're learning more and more every day. So process of my learning, we arrived in Stockton. That's another story. But anyway, the first church service that we went to there. Now, this is the first real Pentecostal service I'd ever been in apostolic in my life okay so I walk into the church and we got there early of course because who I'm married to you're never late you're always early <laughs> so, <It's church. laughs> at least 30 minutes early at least so we walk in and the, the old church over in Cherokee Lane when you walked in the the doors at the back over on that side there were these accordion doors that went from ceiling to floor and wall to wall, and it was a big opening. It was like overflow room, but it also doubled as a prayer room. So those were all closed, and then there was a little doorway that you could go through to get in there. Well, I didn't know what was there. And we walked in, and this is my first introduction to apostolic, Pentecostal, prayer, travail. So I'm hearing this, 
going, woo And I'm like, I can't see where it's coming from, number one. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, I had a hold of his arm, and I think my nails started going into his skin. Because it, I never heard travailing before. And even the, the church that I had gotten the Holy Ghost in, everything there was joy, joy, happy, happy. And no concern about anybody or anything else, just me. You know, all I care about is me, and I'm going to be happy and happy. And okay, that's fine, but there was no concern about, there was no push to reach out and reach others, to care about others, just whatever feel you need. But now I'm in this where here's people who are travailing and seeking God for people they didn't even know. And it, it scared me. I'm going to be really honest. So then we sat down after that calmed down, and he started to explain to me what was going on. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so then I'm sitting there, and service starts, and there was this little lady, two or three rows up ahead of us, and she was just worshiping God with all she had, the tears flowing. You could just see the hunger in her and the desire for more of God. And then all of a sudden, this man walks down the aisle, goes right to her, picks her, grabs her by the hair, yanks her out into the aisle, starts dragging her down, and throws her over his shoulder. And I'm sitting there going, what? And nobody's moving. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> is this normal? Well, it was, and it was a, a new convert who, she was so hungry for God, but her husband was a devil. I mean, an absolute devil. And he was fighting her. He would take her home, tie her up, and she'd get loose, go out the window, and come back to church. I mean, she was, she was serious. She wanted a relationship with God. Well, that impacted me also, to see something like somebody that was so hungry for God that she would take that abuse. He would beat her. He would spit in her face. He would tie her up, pull her hair, just to keep her from coming to church. But it, it just made her more, all the more determined she was coming. And I watched that. In fact, I started babysitting for her two little boys. And I remember she came to the house one day, brought her boys, and her, by that time they were separated. He was on the telephone pole right outside my house working. And she came in white as a sheet. She said, do not answer the door. Don't open the door. When I leave, do not answer the door. I'm like, okay. But, you know, she was going through some stuff. She was, God was bringing her out of that. In fact, today, some of you may know Nate Rios. That's her son, and he is a preacher of the gospel, a pastor. Her faithfulness to God was honored, and her ex-husband even died. And then she married a motorcycle gang member who came to God in one of the street services that the college was having. Just God had it all orchestrated. And look in your life. Look back in your life how God led your path. What were the odds that he grew up in Indiana, I grew up in Arizona, what were the odds that we would ever even cross paths? But God had it orchestrated. And he knows what he has in store for you. In fact, his word says that. He's got great things in, that he's planned for us. All we have to do is follow him. So he's a good God. And when you get further down the road, there's more things to look back on and see how God was leading you, how God was directing your path, even when you didn't know it. You had no idea. You just thought you were making the decisions. But God was putting it in your heart and leading you where he wanted you to go, bringing the right people into your, on your, in your path that you would meet them and they would help you to find his direction. And that, that to me is just so overwhelming and amazing. But then um, as time went by, the kids started arriving. And our first child, I think I told this at, on Mother's Day one year when I spoke how that when they would hand me my baby, the first thing I would do is give them back to God. Before I ever came to any church service, and they were in my arms and said, Jesus, this is your child. You're letting me keep him for a little while. 
Help me to do my best to raise them to love you, but they belong to you, Lord. And if you know, this was a very hard prayer, but I did pray it. If you know that they are going to grow up and walk away from you, take them now. It would be easier to get over the heartbreak of losing my baby than to watch them grow up and walk away from you and be lost. I don't think I could handle that. And I meant that when I prayed it. And it, it was a hard prayer. But I think God has honored that prayer. I have four children who love God, work with all their heart for God, and I thank God for that. But one of the things that we, we instilled in our families, when I would rock my babies while I was nursing them, trying to get them to sleep, I didn't sing, rock a bye baby on a treetop. You're going to fall out of a crib and under the ground. The wind's going to blow. That's scary. Why would you want to put that fear in your child, you know? The cradle's going to blow and down will come baby cradle and all. That's, that's terrifying. <laughs> but instead, as I was rocking my baby, I would sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because... He first loved me. And I would sing that song over and over and over to all four of my babies. So they heard from the beginning of their life that I love Jesus because he loves me. And that's how they grew up, knowing that Jesus loved them. Not because he had to, but he did. And now because he loved them, I'm going to love him and trust him. I'm not going to fall out of a tree in a cradle. But I am in the hands of Jesus, and he loves me. So I love him. And it would get irritating because as they get older, they'd learn the song, and they'd start singing, and then they wouldn't go to sleep because they're singing with you. <laughs> but that's okay. I would rather they were singing that than Mary had a little lamb or something like that. So that was one of the things that I, I really felt was important, was singing to them about Jesus and how that Jesus loved them. And then prayer was very important. Our kids would not go to sleep at night till we prayed over them. And they would not go out the front door to go to school in the morning until we prayed over them. And when I, I didn't just pray over them, go, God, help them have a good day, but Jesus, I plead your blood over my child today because your blood can go where I cannot that your blood can cover them and protect them when I'm not there and the other thing we did was as soon as I was able to come to church was like the next week <laughs> my baby was dedicated I gave them back to Jesus I didn't wait if my family couldn't be there too bad I am dedicating my baby to Jesus ASAP because I want his covering to be over them. I want him, I want, I want the peace of knowing I've given them to Jesus and they're in his hand now. And so as soon as we were in church, we would get a, a friend, another preacher to come and do the dedication as soon as possible because I wanted to, to have that peace in my heart that I had given them back to God. Even though I had done it in the hospital room, I wanted the devil to know for sure they had been given back to Jesus. No questions, no doubts. Um, anything you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, we prayed over every meal. We never sat down and ate until we prayed. Um, Jody, what are some other things?
um, I was talking, actually, I was in my office last night, you know, trying to get things prepared for today, and I got a text from my oldest daughter. She's sending us pictures of albums of the Lanny Wolf Trio that we had when they were little, and different songs she had picked out, wanted to share them. And I was texting her and saying, oh, wow, that's a blast from the past. I had all these albums at one point. And she said, yeah, Mom, I remember them playing in our house. And you had our home. We felt like it was a sanctuary. We felt the love of Jesus by the music we heard. And she said, I'm sitting here weeping now, remembering those things. And it was setting an atmosphere in your home that's conducive to the Spirit of God moving in your home and in your family. It's not just hit or miss, you know, whatever, you know, the kids are off here, you're off there. And that happens as they get older. They get their own little minds and their own, but there's still guidelines. You understand what I'm saying? So we instituted prayer and a spirit of peace in our home. I don't know how many times people would come over and say, I feel such peace here. And it was because the presence of God had been invited into our home. Uh, at that point, we didn't have TV. We didn't have any outside influence. They didn't have um, iPads and all that stuff back then. So it was listen to a record or the radio. And the records are those big CDs. You know, that's what one of my granddaughters called them. <laughs> that's a big CD, Nana. <laughs> Yep, that's what it is. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's how we kept our home, in, you know, in the presence of God, entertaining the presence of God. But each of my children went through trials. And I used to think, oh, my kids will never do that. Don't ever say that. Because they have to go through trials. And you cannot fix them. It's just like a baby bird. If you help that baby bird out of that egg, it will die. It gains strength by fighting its way out of that shell. A butterfly coming out of a cocoon. If you cut that cocoon open, the butterfly will die. Its wings gain strength by struggling to get out of that cocoon. Your children will go through issues. Now, when they're little, yes, you have to step in and stop them from killing each other. You know, <laughs> that's kids. But as they grow, they're going to go through tests and trials. And it's going to be the hardest thing in your life to just step back and let them go through it. Now, that doesn't mean you're not praying for them. And you're not there giving them counsel and advice. But sometimes they just have to go through it on their own. Because when they come through the other side with your arms wide open waiting for them, they have gained strength. And they are now able to stand on their own. Um, when Jolene was about 15, um, I had gone back to work by that time. I was working for a doctor. I was sitting in the doctor's office trying to figure out how to collect all these payments that people weren't making. But I got a phone call from Jolene. And I said, uh, how are you? She goes, Mom, I'm going to go to the beach. I said, who are you going to go with? Some of my friends. I said, well, who are your friends? And she started naming off guys, girls. And I said, well, what are you going to do at the beach? And she said, well, what do you think we're going to do at the beach, Mom? I said, so what are you going to wear when you go to the beach? And she said, Mom, we're going to the beach. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I tried to instill in her a sense of holiness and being pure and not exposing your body. And I tried my best to teach her that from little all the way up. But I had to step back. And I said, okay, Jolene, you're old enough to make a decision for yourself. And we hung up. And from that point, the rest of the day, my stomach was in knots. And I'm praying, oh, God, oh, God, protect her, Jesus. Keep her, Jesus. She's going with boys to the beach. And they're going to wear swimming suits. And, oh, God, she's going to be exposing her body to these boys. And we didn't do that, okay? 
Amen. So, <laughs> um, Amen. after I left the doc doctor's office, I was driving a school bus, so I'm coming home after finishing my route. You do a lot of things when you're a home missionary, home missionary's wife, just to put food on the table, but anyway. <laughs> So I'm driving down the street in the, my bus, and there's a car right in front of me, and I can see Jolene in the passenger seat. And I'm thinking, oh, God, she's alive. Okay, that's good. So <laughs> we pull out, she pulls, the guy pulls up that she's with. She jumps out of the car and runs in the house, and I notice she had short culottes on. Not a swimming suit, but short culottes. And I'm thinking, well, that's a little better. <laughs> So I got pulled up, cleaned my bus up, and I'm trying to not rush in. So I just casual cleaned the bus. I walked in. I went back to my room, put my purse up, and then I tapped on her door. She said, come in. So I went in, and I said, well, did you have fun? <laughs> no, I sat on the beach the whole time holding my legs so nobody would see them. <laughs> And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so she learned through that struggle that she had to go through that God didn't want her just exploiting herself to people, that God wanted her to be covered and to be modest. And I didn't have to say a word. Jesus did it. And you know what? When Jesus teaches us the lessons, they stick. If, if we just do something because somebody's saying, you got to do this, bless, blah, blah, you better do this, and you better do this, and you better do that. It's, they're not, they're, they might do it for a while, but it's not going to stick. It's not going to be in their heart because they didn't get it straight from Jesus. And so, to me, it was a very hard thing for me as a mom, but I had to let her make some choices for herself. And she did learn. And do you want to do the next one? She didn't tell me till it was over. <laughs> I couldn't. You didn't have yes. We didn't have cell phones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, mom was, my wife was much more gentle than I was. And uh, I, the incident that came to my mind when she was talking was, uh, you know, disciplining your children with love. And uh, the only, when I was growing up, my family had issues, and I think a lot of the discipline that my father did was really out of anger. And um, he believed in using the, the belt, and he would beat the fire out of us. Now, on on. On, on the tail end, you understand? Now, he didn't just beat us about the body, but <clears throat> you often learn how to be a parent by the environment you grow up in. And so becoming and developing into a, um, a, a Bible apostolic, a, a person who is seeking God's will and God's way is... is uh, not it, it, it don't just happen because you grew up in a home. You have to learn. Uh, every child, we have four children, and all of them, each of them were different. And Jared, our youngest child, was quite the character. He was uh, constantly uh, um, active. That's... Just say a little, but but I remember when he was uh, in school. Um, I, I don't remember what it was he he did on that particular day, but um, I uh, and I just want to say some things. For example, I do believe that the Bible teaches in spanking a child. I do believe that the Bible teaches in. Uh, the right spirit and the right attitude, and it's not done out of anger. And it, I think there's a, a lot more to it than saying, I believe in spanking the children. There's more to it involved. And I think sometimes the most difficult part is 
controlling yourself, not, not the child. Now, um, I'm not here, to, if, if you don't believe in spanking your children, I'm not here to criticize you. I'm not here to tell you that uh, I think we might have had one of our children that never needed a spanking. All I had to do was sometimes look at my girls. And that was very rare. I think the girls ever received any spankings. Very rare. Girls were different. Hello? Girls are different. Now, I don't mean just because of their body parts. I mean they're different in makeup and their spirit. And they're meant to be gentle creatures. I mean, you can disagree with me, but I got the microphone. They're, they're designed to be gentle. But women, I think, are the most powerful creatures that God created. Son, they can manipulate a man like, hello? <laughs> I don't know what it was Jared did that day, but he got a spanking. And the difficulty with Jared was he never just stayed still. He would do flips, run around the room, and I'm trying to catch him with the belt. And I did, and I blacked an eye. And, you know, at that point, I had to change. At that point, I went and got some help, some counsel, some understanding about disciplining myself that it doesn't help a child when they are abused it hurts them and I you know what I knew was happening was not good for me and Jared and our relationship and his ultimate relationship with God would be damaged and so um, I got some instruction that helped me uh, to discipline particularly Jared and Jason through the rest of their, well, until they got so big that we, they wanted to fight. <laughs> nah, that was, but in, in reality, I remember learning that I needed to have discipline of myself before I exercise correction. Not, this is not judgment. We're not going to, my father's way thought, and, 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 you know, I think my father thought he was doing the right thing. But his way of beating the fire out of us was not, was not discipline. It was his anger and his frustration coming out. And I'm just telling you as parents, as families that represent Jesus Christ, um, we, we must come to a knowledge of being an apostolic family. We found, I've, we've already mentioned, and I can't mention enough, how important prayer is. Learning to pray. And there are dimensions of prayer. There's levels of where you pray for your food, but you don't pray the same way in a desperate situation. It's, it's dimensions of prayer. And the scripture refers to it. There's prayers of intercession and Prayers of travail. It said, when Zion travails, children will be birthed. It's talking about spiritual birth happening, but learning. And so the first thing that I learned with Jared was that we needed to pray together about his actions. And he needed to be able to understand he could bring his guilt for his wrongful actions, even as a child, to a place of prayer, and Jesus would forgive him. It wasn't, you know, it, it became more teaching, more learning, more training than just my frustration being acted out. And, uh, and then uh, we had a, a method, you know, like I would tell them how many swats they were going to get for their actions. And sometimes in church, I would, Jared would just push me. And the people in the church thought, they, so at one point, I was counting. That's one, Jared. And, you know, I, I look back. I'm not telling you that's the right way. Now that we have come through this time in our life, 
there's much better ways. You know, you can do that in the privacy of, of your home. It, how you don't embarrass your children, you will suffer for it later. Don't humiliate people. That's not productive. And, um, and so uh, I, after I would give Jared his swatch, I made him stretch out across the bed, grab the other side, no more running around the room. We're not going to do this. We're going to do this with some discipline. And he would get a couple of swats, and then he would crawl up in my arms and said that after, after we had prayed and after he had asked forgiveness and after there had been, and somebody said, well, you don't have to do that. Let me just say this. One thing that I learned about however you take care of discipline, guilt is a very real thing in people's life, whether you deny it or not. When you do wrong, you automatically can't get a, a, an amount of guilt. And that guilt has to be dealt with or it will destroy your life. There has to be some way, some uh, method that you have for dealing with the guilt, even in your child's life. If they just harbor it inside, they can become hardened no longer sensitive, no longer tender to God, and no longer sensitive even to your instruction. And, um, and so after we would go through this, it was a procedure. It was, uh, he knew how we was going to do this. And after a while, it became a disciplined action. And, uh, and then he would uh, hug me and say, Dad, forgive me, I shouldn't have acted like that, you know? Uh, then you know the process is really working. And uh, I thought, I know we've got thing, other things in our notes, but I'm telling you, I, I don't know where all the instruction is going to come. We need to be able to help one another become apostolic families. And some of the things that I just mentioned are details. We got a lot of little children running around here. I, I want you... I know one of the things we talked about was how I, you're a guest here maybe and you see the children come up here and they're worshiping or they're running around. Maybe, maybe in their eyes, they're having fun. Hello? And you may say, well, I don't think they ought to do that. And I personally, we believe that how do you expect them to grow up to be worshipers if they don't have the opportunity to worship as a child. And, and so I know you may not agree with it. You're entitled to your opinion, but I have the microphone. Anything you want to add? I just, they're learning. They're learning. They're learning. And I know our, they're coming in, so our time must be over. Yes? It, yes. When my kids were little, they used to play church. Jolene would be the piano player. Jason would be the drummer. Jody would beat a mean tambourine. She still can. And Jared would be either the sinner or the preacher, depending on what was happening. <laughs> and somebody came over one time and they were playing. They were, they were having a good time. And they said, you shouldn't let them do that. And I looked at them and said, why not? Well, that's, that's blasphemy. I said, that is not I would rather they were playing church than cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians and shooting and bang, bang and killing. They're playing church and they're practicing worship. Amen. I remember Jared was the preacher one Sunday and he laid hands on Jason's head and Jason had a Holy Ghost fit and scared Jared to death. <laughs> but it was so, I enjoyed watching them. I mean, Jolene would sit at the uh, piano stool and she couldn't play the piano yet. And she'd just be playing and singing, and Jody's over there beating that tambourine, and they're having church. And I thought, you know what? You do your home, I'll do mine. I want to let them, if they want to play church, that's okay, because now they're really doing church. Hey Amen. Would you stand with us? I know we have one more week of... And we, honestly, we don't take this lightly. All week long, we're, we think of things, and there are many things that we haven't said 
We want our families to have the opportunity to grow and develop into Christ-like families. And so uh, you pray for us this week, and we got one more week. Hopefully we will say some things. Hopefully today some things were said that will help you and help our families. Amen?